were quite astonished by, you know, how crowded the room has come. And so many who have wanted to uh, come to this final research seminar uh, for Term 1. We're very, obviously very gratified that uh, our panel, you know, draws this attraction. I should also mention that this is, uh, you know, jointly, uh, and, and, and we're very grateful to the Institute of Archaeology for being the host also to this uh, uh, Centre for Research in the Dynamics of Civilization, the CREDOC seminar as well, so that we can uh, advertise that a little. The one thing I would say about that is that the, we will be advertising small grants uh, by the end of this week for CREDOC. So uh, if any of you have uh, uh, particularly research projects, either a master's or PhD level, that you think are civilizational, uh, then please uh, do look out on the website, the CREDOC website for these small grants. Uh, you know, they're up to £5,000, so, uh, and for various, uh, both conferences and as well as doing small uh, pieces of research. So I think they're quite valuable. Okay, we have four panelists on the theme of debating civilization perspectives from archaeology. The aim here is to say we have this problematic concept of civilization. Uh, I noted, uh, for example, uh, the most recent, one of the most recent uses of the term is in the uh, title of Ian Hodder's book, and, uh, you know, Civilization and Religion. And uh, throughout the whole text, it's in, civilization is in scare quotes. So, I mean, there's something very ambiguous and ambivalent about it, but also, clearly, I think, in a way, we look at the way in which how archaeology, in particular, you know, sort of, well, you have used the, the concept in the past, and uh, how archaeology believes or thinks about this as an organizing concept, as an analytic concept. Uh, and it's the importance of that that we uh, want to address this evening. So we have four speakers. Um, we're going to start with uh, David, David Wengro, who are all well known to you, and I uh, don't think we need to introduce David at all. And then we will follow by uh, Andy Bevan, and then Dorian, and then uh, I, whilst I'm chairing, I'll also be the last speaker, and I'll try, and uh, if there's still time, uh, you know, to uh, give some, you know, some other points. And then we've asked Beverly uh, uh, to act as discussant. And there is a kind of idea of four four men in a row here it was talking a about civilization. That it was four white men talking about civilization. So I'm here standing That's all right, but, civilized. But you also you know, have great like intellectual, uh, you know, sort of uh, kudos here to you know, give us here to organise our discussion. So let me start with David. Did my usual white male supremacist um, <laughs> concept of civilization. I actually want to um, make the case that the concept uh, has some utility and should be retained uh, in archaeology, but that it's only really useful to do that if we uh, problematize the relationship between this concept of civilization and another concept, which is the state, uh, because uh, the argument I'm going to try to make in how long have I got? Minutes, right. Right. Okay. Ten minutes each. The argument I'm going to try to make in 10 minutes is that these two concepts, uh, civilization and the state, have been um, mixed together in archaeology in rather uh, unreflective uh, ways, and that it's important to try and examine a little bit what the relationship between them is and what happens if we begin to prize them apart. Um, I wanted to start with a, a concrete example of this. Um, this kind of uh, jumbling up of concepts, which is a whole series of um, monumental tombs which uh, were built about um, 5,000 years ago in the south of Egypt. And uh, there's not really much left of them now. In fact, they're all covered up with sand because of looting. Um, but it's been possible for archaeologists to reconstruct uh, a bit of what these, uh, these places were and what they originally uh, looked like at the very beginnings of uh, the dynastic state. And it's very clear, I mean they're much older than the, uh, the, the famous pyramids on the Giza Plateau, but it's very clear that in their time they were real technological marvels. There are scraps of the various media that were used to build them, 
um, which included all kinds of wonderful, precious, exotic materials that were brought from as far away as the, um, the cedar forests of Lebanon to the north, uh, or the stone quarries of Aswan to the south. Um, so these were real sort of technological marvels uh, at the time. Um, and within them, um, and I should say these are probably the burial places of the world's first uh, known royal dynasty, uh, and within them were quite literally thousands of objects, some of which bear uh, what uh, is uh, some of the earliest evidence for writing and literacy uh, anywhere in the world, and a lot of this is attached to grave goods. And it seems as if writing and literacy were partly invented in this part of the world in the service of these kind of exceptional uh, monumental ceremonies. But around the main tombs, as you can see, are also quite literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of smaller mud brick tombs uh, where people were killed, ritually sacrificed, uh, and then buried uh, around the burial of the ruler. And we know this from studies of mortality, uh, age profiles uh, here and at other uh, elite cemeteries of the period. Um, so what we've got here, and I should also add that you know, amongst these many, many grave goods, um, are all kinds of things like uh, wonderful sort of perfumes and oils, other kind of socially exciting innovations of the time, like chairs and tables. Uh, and all of this was brought there with the latest modes of high-speed transport, uh, pack donkeys and boats, uh, sailing boats. Um, so uh, on the one hand here we have uh, something that's technologically very marvelous uh, and impressive, um, but uh, on the other hand um, we have something rather alarming, which is human sacrifice uh, on a, uh, a really quite enormous scale. So if we look at this as a sort of glimpse of the, uh, the state or the body politic at its moment of inception, uh, we see two things really. Uh, we see on the one hand something um, rather alarming and unfamiliar, um, but on the other hand um, we see the beginnings of uh, a whole set of behaviours, ways of uh, eating, drinking, presenting and comporting the body, interacting socially, um, which are very instantly recognizable to us because we basically still do them. And through the spread of these kind of complex fashions and cuisine, um, this kind of civilizational package of received ways of, of behaving and presenting oneself has been disseminated through a large part of the world. So to paraphrase the anthropologist uh, Pierre Clastre, uh, one could say that a particular civilization of the state uh, has become conceptually tied to the general state of civilization. That's the way he puts it. So my point here is really that, that in ways which are now rather difficult for us to um, disentangle, the origin of states has become bound up with the origin of now completely familiar ways of life that seem to us almost as second nature, just as so many ways of simply being civilized. And it's in that kind of context that I want to think a little bit about how archaeologists define uh, what they mean when they say early civilizations. And traditionally, this has involved putting together a, a sort of list of societies. Uh, the usual ones that get in there are Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Maya, the Aztecs, the, uh, the Inca Empire, Shang China, occasionally a few other sort of sneak in, like the Yoruba or the Indus Valley cities. Uh, but when it comes to actually defining what they all have in common, uh, it seems to me that the whole concept of civilization sort of drops out of the equation. And people begin to talk about things like class stratification, urbanization, literate administration, and by this point really civilization has just become a sort of umbrella term for a whole load of other things that you can perfectly well describe without using the concept a single time. Um, now it seems to me that the assumption here is really that it is only centralized political states that are able to create these very large scale uh, moral communities. Uh, it's kind of moral consensus on a very large scale. Uh, and if that were true, then I think maybe there would be a case for saying that state and civilization were broadly the same thing. 
but I don't think it is true, um, and I think actually archaeology uh, provides some of the most powerful counterexamples uh, in showing that it is perfectly possible to have very large-scale civilizations without the state or in fact against the state. Um, and just a couple of brief examples of that. Um, it's still normal uh, here and in most places to talk about an urban revolution uh, which is supposed to have happened in the Middle East about 6,000 years ago with the appearance of sites that are about 250 hectares uh, large places <coughs> like Uruk in southern Iraq and we still teach our undergraduates that way we still write books about the urban revolution there. This is very strange, really, when it's been well known for quite a number of decades that to the north of the Black Sea, at exactly the same time in the 4th millennium BC, one actually has human settlement on a considerably larger scale, with 400 hectare sites, like Talianki uh, in the modern Ukraine, uh, with tens of thousands of inhabitants. And what's particularly intriguing about these cities to the north of the Black Sea, and I don't hesitate to call them cities, although a lot of people do, is that they have no evidence for any of the typical features of states. No literate administration, no royal tombs, no political elites, no monumental structures, no centralized storage, just these sort of uh, concentric circles of houses that all look rather similar and suggest a kind of robustly egalitarian ethos. Now these are never included uh, in that roster of early civilizations, and I think it's worth dwelling a bit on what the implications of that exclusion uh, are. And then if we just look very briefly at the Middle East itself, what I've tried to represent on this map is roughly what the Middle East looked like after about a thousand years of urban life. And what you see actually is quite surprising, which is that the areas in the red circles, which very roughly represent the territories that urban states with centralized governments and managerial elites the areas that they actually have some kind of control over in terms of taxation uh, are actually, you know, geographically rather small. But then around them we see something else, which is not some kind of fragmented tribal frontier made up of little small bands of hunter-gatherers or something. What we see around them is this absolutely vast purple splotch, which represents uh, an area going from the, uh, the Caucasus down to modern-day western Iran in the other direction, all the way down to the Jordan Valley. And what this uh, big purple splotch represents is a common set of social and cultural practices that are shared by relatively small-scale, relatively egalitarian societies over a truly enormous area. And these shared practices are especially evident in things like cuisine, where they use these very, very distinctive cooking vessels with lids. This is very much a culture of boiling and stewing foods, often on these uh, nice uh, little uh, hearths with their anthropomorphic faces. Um, and um, it's, it's a bit sort of insufficient to simply describe this as an archaeological culture or a culture area. And partly what that ignores is that these are societies which are developing, growing up, uh, on the margins of states, of urban, politically centralized states. Uh, and in fact, in certain features of their cuisine and their domestic life, they seem to have uh, developed their own society in a sort of conscious opposition to what goes on <coughs> down there in the lowland river valley states, where, for example, sacrificial cooking for the gods is always about uh, roasting and baking, so that, you know, the fumes go up and the gods are attracted down towards their mortal uh, subjects, uh, like in ancient Greece and Rome as well. Um, so we have culinary differences on a large scale which uh, you know, make you think of things like the Catholic missionaries going over to the New World and trying to convert the Tupi, but then having trouble giving them the communion because they won't eat this weird stuff called bread. Uh, it's these kind of culinary uh, cultural differences that I think civilizing missions either rise or fall on uh, historically. Uh, I should probably stop in a minute, so I'll stop um, by just uh, going back to the idea of centers um, and, uh, and those societies that have traditionally been referred to as early civilizations. Um, I think one of the interesting things that they all have in common is that they present us with a kind of vastly magnified version of cultural values 
that are actually very well established on a smaller scale in the same regions. So I'm thinking here of things like the monumental temple precincts at the heart of the earliest Mesopotamian cities, where the ground plans exactly replicate on a larger scale a completely normal kind of domestic household form that goes back thousands of years earlier uh, to village-scale societies in the same region. I'm thinking in the same kind of way about some of the earliest dynastic monuments from Egypt, which are basically spectacular versions of ordinary cosmetic grinding palettes that go all the way back to the Neolithic in the Nile Valley. And you could probably think of things like the great bathing facilities at places like Harappa, Mahenjo-Daro in similar terms. So in every case, we have very familiar and well-established concepts of domesticity, cleanliness, well-being, being reproduced on a greatly magnified scale. And I think that for all of their um, exclusionary uh, qualities, we can hardly doubt that these centers must have offered their residents a kind of image of cosmological perfection. And it was in this, this rather fragile, probably utopian kind of setting that state-like systems of government seem to have been first invented. But the point that I want to finish on is really that the values of civilization, or what I would call the values of civilization, in which those particular political projects were grounded, those values were older and they were more durable than the political projects themselves. Even at the height of ancient empires, they never truly encompassed these larger zones of shared practices and moral norms. So my argument really uh, today is that if we reduce our definition of early civilization to the formation of states, we risk losing sight of these much longer and more spatially extensive trajectories of cultural change. I think we have to look for their roots in the history of earlier prehistoric societies that succeeded for thousands of years in maintaining distinct forms of civilization while avoiding the emergence of states. Okay, thank you very much. Good, that's got us off to a rousing start, I think. Yes, uh, with a good, good uh, oppositional point. Uh, and Eagle will uh, now take over. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, maybe start where David left off with some well, terminology and uh, raise some issues that um, they lurk in a lot of different subjects, but I haven't seen too many people call them out on the question recently, at least. Um, I want to start not with civilization as a term, but with ancient world, which is invoked in various places, both in sort of popular discussions and also particularly in North America in terms of the structure of, of academic life. Um, and it's a very odd term if you think about it, because it could mean pretty much anything, and maybe in that ambivalence is some of its continuing power. But it could mean something like everything anywhere before the present day. When people say ancient, that's often what they mean. It could mean some exotic prior sort of civilized state with some sort of hidden cultural mysteries. For some people, it's quite specific. It means a certain period of time with a focus in the Mediterranean region. Um, and with uh, some sort of reference to Greco-Roman or Judeo-Christian thought. Um, and for others, it's some sort of catch-all for lots of different civilizations, so so-called peak periods of global cultural behavior, uh, maybe axial ages. And they tend to have a sort of geographic bias. They tend to be focused in the, in the mid-latitudes of, uh, of the world. So. You can pick any one of those definitions, and if you're a different kind of ancient world center somewhere doing various kinds of academic research, you may prioritize one or the other. That other word is also a little bit awkward, isn't it? So, world. When people talk about world in a, a pre-modern context, they're often invoking some category which is larger than the nation state, perceived state, but is still smaller than the planet. So, the borders of it are a bit sort of um, fuzzy to define, and maybe we should be thinking about whether there really are differences when we start talking about world at the sort of proper planetary scale that we do today. Um, civilization is also one of these difficult terms. I don't really want to sort of um, leap into it, um, particularly now, maybe come back to it at the end. 
but of course, as David mentioned, it can be treated as a checklist of achievements to some degree or another. It's uh, associated with perceived long-term legacies, supranational uh, identities, um, and a lot of the sort of um, these kinds of dichotomies are often um, evoked. So pre-modern versus modern, or Western versus Eastern. I think all of that's a little bit um, problematic. Um, and to be perfectly honest, it's not a term that um, you know, I've, I've used myself a lot in terms of personal research. But I do think there are ways in which you can play with large-scale, long-term analysis that does uh, tackle these sorts of issues um, indirectly. And I'll probably be placing a little bit more emphasis on portable material culture in the focus. But before I do that, I'd just also like to talk about this, which is a set of terms that um, have become um, very popular, not um, least because of a lot of work being done at UCL over the last um, 10 to 20 years. But the idea that we can think of long-term cultural behaviors as either part of branching behaviors, tree-like in the way in which they operate, long lineages of artifacts or lineages of political thinking or whatever, or we can think of very network blended hybridizing approaches to culture. And both of those are, are, are in a sense rival explanatory modes. You can either test them formally or you could think about them informally, but regardless, they tend to dominate our thinking about large scale cultural behavior. So for example, Several people have tried to arrange the so-called civilizations of the world, particularly the old world, into a series, into a, a tree-like uh, diagram, um, spreading out from um, the Neolithic and, and differentiating, if you like. If you think of the popular understanding of this in terms of the, the computer gaming industry, you've got uh, technological trees and things like civilization, which are your, your route through time, if you like. Um, you've also got things like at the portable uh, artifact scale, you've got these amazing encounters between the so-called barbarian world and the so-called civilized world, for example, in this case, um, in the Mediterranean, where you've got coins of Philip and Alexander of Macedon that probably in some way are implicated in the um, uh, paying off of mercenaries um, for um, their, their role in, in the Mediterranean and Persian campaigns. That those coins that start off being minted by um, Philip and Alexander, gradually they start getting copied in various parts of Celtic Europe. And as they get copied, they get maybe a little bit hard for you to see, but they get increasingly stylized. So the head of uh, Hercules or of Alexander or of Philip gets very, very mutated in its form. It loses a lot of its structure. The, uh, the horse-drawn chariot on the other side of the coin also becomes this incredibly abstract design with flickers of the original right through until the first century BC. So over a period of some 300 years at least, spreading out from uh, Macedonian Greece in several different directions, but particularly northwest into Europe, you're getting this, uh, this tree-like pattern of change. And that situation with respect to so-called barbarian Europe is also interesting from that cultural blending point of view as well, of course, because several commentators have pointed out how it is really an interaction between different kinds of more agrarian and urbanized communities and um, uh, others that are structured differently, as David just pointed out, that um, it, it's often behind a lot of uh, discussion about civilization. I also wanted to just raise some of the issues lurking in the background if you do any kind of long term um, or widespread kind of um, systematic analysis, and that's to do with definitions, and that they are a real problem that we sort of don't necessarily um, define, we don't acknowledge properly. So here's a good one from prior to when we might think about um, so-called civilizations, but um, near eight Neolithic phases of Europe as described in a fairly traditional cultural historical manner um, in a cultural atlas, European cultural atlas. So lots and lots of these time slices with different polygons representing different cultural areas across Europe. The interesting thing is that those atlases, those polygons, they don't cover all of Europe. As you can see, there are gaps in that definition. And if you stack up those different time slices um, across the different eight phases of the Neolithic, the really remarkable thing is that you get something like this, where you have repeated areas of the world that, get, that achieve culture area status, if you like. They have maybe pottery sequences that allow them to be identified easily, or lithic tool sequences, or maybe they're close to modern urban zones or modern agriculture where people are doing a lot more of the study. But for whatever reason, 
there are the haves and the have-nots in terms of the definition of culture long term. So the dark red areas there, think of the Paris Basin, Central Germany, Rome Valley, those areas repeatedly get that defined as a culture. And I think you could draw that out throughout human history, that we don't really create level playing in our comparisons uh, over large expanses or long time periods. One last thing before I sort of move on to a, an example um, is that I think when we think about these long, long trajectories of cultural change, and some of them we associate with um, civilizations, we should be thinking about this, which is periods of increasing canonization of the civilizational values that people hold in common versus periods of dramatic experimentation. Um, and I think um, Sue Sherrod, amongst others, has pulled this out really nicely with respect to Homeric ethic, where she's pulled out the layering in which you get periods of great experimentation with the canon of the ideas that are put into the Homeric cycle, and other periods where there are, they are um, held fast and a far more conservative approach. Um, and I think in the background is also a question to do with population, another topic and term that's been particularly uh, stressed here at UCL. Um, and that's really to do with the fact that there are moving people and expanding populations and contracting populations behind these periods of conservatism and experimentation. We'll come back to that second. Um, I wanted to really just um, play with uh, an example using portable material culture to give you a sense of why I think some of these long-term studies do uh, have a useful purchase on issues to do with, with uh, questions of civilization. Um, and this is really looking at transport jars and uh, how crucial they are to what is seen as civilized Mediterranean life through incredibly long time periods, starting really from sometime in the third millennium BC. And from at least the mid-second millennium BC, you have an incredibly specialized set of um, containers for the transport of particularly liquid goods across the Mediterranean, but also a wide array of other uh, products. And they come in a di diverse range of forms already by 1200 BC. You get incredibly bijou ones like these over here, which are sort of a highly decorated, highly branded micro packaging of the same kinds of products. And those products, the contents are of course very important. They are in a sense part of the early, early definition of a so-called Mediterranean diet. Uh, wine, olive oil, and it's alongside those products moving in and sailing ships, a whole range of, of other um, cultural, a um, uh, larger cultural package. Um, these kinds of uh, goods, they are incredibly closely bound with the cultural clashes that you see in this region over the long term. So for example, um, amphoras are very, very important from the, in the Greek and Roman world, and in contrast, they're set against the beer drinking cultures of Northern Europe from the period of, of Pliny onwards. And in that um, world, you've got people using barrels to brew beer and transport that beer. And when they're invaded by the Roman Empire, that invasion is, is evoked as, a, as a, uh, a group of people sitting up in their hill fort trying to fight off the, the Roman invaders by rolling down flaming barrels that they were reusing, no longer being used for beer, but being used for defense. And that, con that contrast between the amphora using Mediterranean world and the, the beer drinking barrel using Celtic uh, uh, parts of Europe was one that persisted for quite a long time. Um, likewise, in later um, medieval periods, you've got a contrast between the crusading um, well, Western armies carrying all of their provisions to the east in barrels and the continuing amphora using eastern and southern parts of the Mediterranean. And one nice example of that is uh, the so-called recovery of the relics of St. Mark from Alexandria. These are the relics that are supposed to be the sort of the foundational myth, myth of um, medieval Venice. Well, they're recovered in a typical Alexandrian non-Western um, transport container, the Sporta, famous leather satchel of Alexandria. And they are carried hidden in, in piles of pork because the local Muslim authorities wouldn't be able to find the, the relics of the saint <coughs> under the pork. So containers have been very, very important from that perspective all, uh, all the way through Mediterranean history. Um, containers are also something that aren't just simply about moving products, they are, they're associated with the human body as well. They obviously force certain kinds of gestural behaviors as they're transported from the dockside up into the city, for example, or they're moved around the boat. 
Um, they're also important in terms of the accounting. They are a size, which is typical for, say, a donkey load. They're the size of they're the way in which people count up commodities through thousands of years of history. Um, other containers, such as this huge um, oxhide um, leather bag, that's not just simply used to move liquids across most of Mediterranean, um, uh, the, the Mediterranean world. It's also actually defined as the way in which you um, punish somebody who's killed their father in the Roman Empire. You wrap up that person in one of these bags, you put in various live animals, and you carry them to the sea and throw them in. So it's very much justice by containerized transport um, that uh, that's the way it all operates. Um, they're also used, uh, amphoras and various other um, containers are used for urinals, they're used for uh, burial coffins, they're used as reliquaries, they're used in a variety of ways that are fairly intimately related to the human body. Um, more generally, it's the doxi and the exchange of parcels, as captured very nicely by um, Paul Vernet um, in Marseille, where you get this sort of um, interaction of cultures, different civilizations in the Mediterranean world, as they haggle over different kinds of containers that are being loaded on the port. Um, I think this is open to formalized analysis as well, because these are traditions that are archaeologically recoverable. So for example, um, this is just a pattern of elongation of this one style of amphora container over a period of about 500 years. Without the capacity changing, the shape changes quite obviously. It's something that people have noted informally uh, quite a lot. If you take every single typology between, say, 750 BC and 1250 AD, so that's hundreds and hundreds of types of these amphoras, and you, you do, say, a bivariate histogram, what you get is a massive climbing in the height to width ratios for about 700 years. So something is happening to those amphoras without it being a capacity change overall, which must be explaining something quite interesting and long term. And it's probably, I would say, to do with changing primary contents and also changing depth of ship holes as ships overall get bigger and deeper. But also, I hope you'll be able to see that these letterings here, A, B, C, D, and E, they roughly re uh, reflect certain major geopolitical shifts but they're trapped a little bit in terms of the, the profile of the different amphoras on an incredibly basic measure, such as the height to width ratio. And frankly, there's a lot more that can be done if you start modeling them phylogenetically and with a, a wider range of, 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 uh, of shape metrics as well. And they correlate quite strongly with things like the macroeconomics of lead pollution associated with metallurgy in, in the Spanish lakes and the numbers of shipwrecks found in the Mediterranean as well. So this long-term trend is really quite interesting to play with. And finally, really, I wanted to just say that this relates, I think, to a wider issue to do with concentrations of population and changes in levels of innovation that might, uh, I might take you back to that issue of canonization versus experimentation. Joyce Marcus, among others, has talked about the way in which major civilizational areas, if you like, go through periods of greater integration or, or, or greater collapse, if you like, in, in things that look very periodic as, as patterning. You can see the same thing, actually, if you look at um, the pattern of container culture through the Mediterranean. It goes through periods of abrupt shift. This red line is not a good description of technological progress in, in the use of containers in the Mediterranean. Rather, you're getting these periods of change that are more uh, pulse-like, if you like. And the same can be said for the underlying human demography as well. Not only should we anticipate that we so far find difficult to uh, visualize changing population numbers in aggregate in this region, we should also expect the spatial structure of that population to be varying in interesting ways, such as uh, flight and recovery from the coast, but also nucleation and dispersal of that population into bigger and smaller um, uh, settlements. So I think um, all of that leaves all sorts of possibilities for looking at these long-term spatial trends and homological trends from the perspective of portable material culture. And I think there's an interesting link there, although not one necessarily that I'm, I'm entirely um, expert in, in analyzing, but looking at um, uh, the history of, of crops as well and, and the genetics of, of major commodified uh, products in the Mediterranean. So the, the typologies of, of amphoras and barrels and other containers 
they may relate in interesting ways to uh, the development post-domestication of different vintages of wines, for example, different kinds of olive, uh, particular olives, and all of those sorts of um, interesting uh, plant histories. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to throw out the word civilization um, and suggest that we can think about uh, mapping and looking at cultural interactions uh, through a different lens, because civilization tends to leave a lot of the world out. Um, so I'm going to tr try to pr propose uh, a, a, what, I would call, what I will call as a working term ecologizations. I then might come back a little bit to what uh, civilization means for uh, global environment in the long term. So archaeologists, many of us, myself included, love to look for origins, and so we produce maps like this one, which is centers of origin of agriculture. Um, and of course, when you look at when you look at the world this way, it excludes most of the globe, which means it excludes most past societies. Um, and the same is true if you take your early civilizations, however one defines them, if you include the Yoruba and the Indus and so forth, as, as David mentioned. So these stars are the kind of foci that people talk about in terms of early civilizations, which again excludes uh, much of the world. And I'll come back at the end, uh, uh, it tends to privilege what we might think of as the great destroyers of the globe, too. Um, so how can, we, how can we escape this and try to include more of uh, the human past at its largest scale? Uh, so I'm going to propose that we can think about ecologizations as kind of conjunctures of cultural ecology and landscape practice. So it involves both things like subsistence, but also how the landscape is used and perceived, and how different groups uh, interact across wide areas of, of the world of, of landscape. So those shared traditions of land use and landscape perception, which often uh, span over large areas, they may cross multiple cultural areas in, in traditional archaeological terms, cross-cut ethnicities that we might define on linguistic terms, uh, and, and they involve very often uh, sort of interrelated um, subsistence systems which have relationships of trade and exchange. Now the concept is very similar to Braudel's sense of the long durée, uh, and, I, um, and that's, uh, I, I can clearly recognize. Of course, Braudel was trapped by a focus on written sources and didn't really delve into the archaeological evidence. And I think by this means we can look at the whole inhabited globe in different time periods and look at how it can be grouped into ecologizations. And some of these are long-lasting, uh, and some of them may divide, so sort of phylogenetic processes over time, branching processes, and some may merge, uh, so the kind of blending processes that Andrew was just talking about. So of course, the world is very often broken up into things like biomes, and that's not what I'm talking about here. So biomes and ecologizations are not the same thing. That may be a good starting point. So this is the US Department of Agriculture's official ecological zonation of the old world, for what it's worth. Uh, so what I'm going to do is use that as a, as a template just to think about, a kind of sketch in cartoon fashion, what we might start to think about as examples of ecologizations. Uh, this is very much a kind of incomplete and partial uh, back of the envelope, sitting on an airplane, um, sort of how, how we start to divide up the world. But this is, of course, for different time periods, it's going to be different. So I've taken a kind of mid-Holocene. This is the period when people tend to talk about the rise of civilization. <coughs> uh, and so we've got, you know, Sahelo pastoralism, which really extends into southern Arabia. You've got Nile, so Egypt and Nubia. You've got an early Mediterranean what I would call the indo mesopo and hinterlands. And I think with this, it's an artificial division between the Indus Valley and, the, and Mesopotamia in terms of what's really happening in terms of use of landscape and, and ecology. The Deccan is quite different. China has got a couple of areas, the Chulman and Joman and related Siberian traditions, uh, steppic traditions and so forth. I haven't put the Tripoliane Kukuteni culture, which should be up there in one of the gaps. So we can start to think about this. What I'm, I'd like to do, because I only have a few, few minutes, is is just illustrate in a kind of cartoon fashion of what a few of these kind of look like, why there are similarities, and then I'm going to suggest that there's, uh, suggest perhaps a method for trying to uh, define these a bit more precisely, sort of semi-quantitatively, uh, as a way to take this kind of approach forward. 
So the classic kind of, I suppose, decolonization is the Mediterranean. And of course, Bradell defines this. This is his map from the 60s, which he really defines it as focused on all of cultivation. So these inner dark lines are the limits of all of cultivation and the hatched lines of the Roman Empire and how it kind of it relates. Um, but of course, it's not a single, the skinny point out, it's not a single cultural ecology. It's a set of interrelated cultural practices that are codependent. So of course, you have your olive trees, but you also have your cereal and pulse cultivation. You have your transhuman pastoralism using the hill zones and so forth. And of course, you have your uh, coastal fisher folk, your octopus fishermen, and your uh, your trade that links these together over large areas. So, so it's not just one cultural ecology, but a set of interdependent and inter intertwined holes. Of course, the parts of the Mediterranean that are involved in that at any one time may vary over time. So one can start to think about how, how ecologizations might develop in certain areas and then spread to take over larger areas and then perhaps subdivide by branching processes in, 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 to become different uh, kind of regional um, traditions. And of course, this zone cuts across lots of different ethno-linguistic groups, lots of different uh, traditional archaeological cultures but that share something in common and there are flows of material and flows of ideas between them so that we can start to analyze them as a kind of larger whole that hopefully escapes civilization. So another nice example is what I was referring to as the Sahelo pastoralists. Uh, it's roughly it evolves out of what some people refer to as the, the aqualithic, although in African archaeology circles the aqualithic is kind of a bad word these days. I mean, is allowed, is supposed to use it. But essentially, as we know, the Sahelian zone and the southern Sahara uh, is greener in the early Holocene. We have a nice, it's mapped by a distribution of early Holocene ceramics. And after about 6,000 BC, you get uh, the spread of pastoralism through this zone. Um, and, and you get the emergence of various forms of monumentality. So there are these megaliths of Southern Omar, or you can look at the megaliths of Nautilus. There's, there's a series of things in which it's, it's a very mobile pastoralist lifestyle. There's a big emphasis on hunting, and use of ostrich egg shell for ornamentation, tethering stones, monumentality, etc. that stretches across a very large area. It must be highly multi-ethnic, but there's still similarities and flows and the importance of sheep, goat, and cattle right across this zone. And then within, from, from within this ecolog ecologization, uh, you get uh, eventually uh, the emergence of plant cultivation very much in parallel. So you get the West African pearl millet, and the East African sorghums, which very much represent parallel evolution of the same tradition. And in some sense, they remain, uh, to, to a large degree, similar and unified. And we think there are flows between them, so the flow of crops, the flow of commodities, the flow of uh, stone beads and ideas and so forth. But you do get a kind of, eventually a kind of hiving off, a, a branching, a separation of the Arabian world and the Red Sea coast, which gets much more focused on things like incense production and trade with the Mesopotamian and the Indus Valley world. And so you get a kind, of set, a, a kind of branching process within this earlier ecologization. So I would suggest that there's, there's wide areas of interesting comparisons which, don't, which tend to be separated because they're on different Arabian archaeologists and African archaeologists are not supposed to talk to each other. Those are different continents. But there's a lot of interesting uh, similarities. Um, Ethiopia provides a fascinating case which really is an island to itself. It's not really like anywhere else in Africa. The highland ecological systems and I won't go into too much about it, but it, it, you know, you have your insect groves and the basic solution for food preparation, you take it, you mash it up, you bury it in the ground for two weeks until it smells bad, then you dig it up, sell it at market, and turn it into all sorts of wonderful food. So there's a whole different culinary repertoire, which is, I think, unique to the Ethiopian islands, which then lends itself to all sorts of unique crops and cultural practices. Okay, so how might you try to uh, define these and sort of turn this into something that we could employ. So this is an attempt to, to think of it in terms of three sets of variables to have it really quantified here, but it kind of, you could think of them as ratio. So one is a, a ratio of delayed returns to immediate returns on this axis. One is a ratio of uh, the amount of surplus production and storage, so the importance of that, and the amount, and the other is a mobility, so how sedentary or mobile is the society. So to put that in some simple terms, in terms of classic kind of modes of production, you can think about you know, your immediate return hunter-gatherers versus delayed return food-producing villagers, transhuman food producers, nomadic pastoralists, your classic Gordon Child urban society, civilizations are down here. But if we use that as a kind of tool for thinking about how would we map in this kind of subsistence space 
changes over time within a region and, and different regions that are linked together. So this was a, a crude attempt to say, look at the Near East. So you have your, your movement through this subsistence triangle from the Kabar to the Natufian to the pre-pottery Neolithic as you move towards more, set, more sedentism, uh, a, 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 a higher uh, ratio of labor to land, so land becomes increasingly valuable, a, a more delayed return. But then you get a kind of juncture where things diverge, and some societies become more mobile, more, nomad, no, more nom nomadic. But of course, they're very focused on delayed returns, but nomadism is about producing milk and wool and animals that you can trade, and you're intertied within these very large sort of classic Bronze Age polities. And so you get interdependencies then, so I've ringed this all in red because these are very much interdependent. So the ecologization of this indo mesopotamia alluvia and hinterlands requires that you have the nomads, requires that you have the settled and the, and the mobile as part of one system. It doesn't work without that. Now, of course, this is very often talked about in terms of a core periphery kind of model, but I think that that tends to privilege the urban core and, and forget about all the important contributions that are coming from uh, the outside. Okay, so what about the Sahelo pastoralism? If we were to map that, it sort of sits somewhere in the middle. So this is a kind of movement from the late Paleolithic to the Mesolithic, Neolithic, and Iron Age in, let's say, the Sudanic savannas of, of, of Central Sudan. Or, or very similar trajectories in northern Mali. So it maps slightly differently, but it's also, again, unified uh, in terms of flows and exchanges within this broader zone. And then we can use this as a way to start to think about how different regions might map. So it's kind of a nilotic, uh, a, a, a nilotic ecologization, which has the more sedentary uh, uh, middle, the lower Nile Valley in Egypt, and the slightly more uh, pastoralist focused Nile and Nubia, but it is still very much intertwined as one sort of unit. And we can think about how the, the Deccan, South Indian Neolithic, the Iron Age traditions might map. And so if you start to do this, it provides a way in which we can start to think about how different parts of the world compare and contrast, and how developments through time uh, start to uh, lead to convergence or divergence within these traditions. And there's a kind of, eventually the, it, the Indus really becomes part of the Gangetic world and is very separate then from the indo mesopo uh, alluvial hinterland. So I would say in the first millennium BC, the indo gangetic alluvial plains become a different sort of world in which the, the much more mobile nomadic lifestyles are much <coughs> more outside. Okay. Now, of course, I've only given old world examples and I just thought, well, okay, I'm not really a new world person, but I should think about it. So, and I think that we can also look at the new world in the same way. That's misspelled, but it should say Mesoamerican. And MILP is really the key ecology. <laughs> this is a site of, one of the things, of course, that defines Mesoamerican civilization, but also in the American, the U.S. Southwest, is these ball courts. And here's a ball court in Las Plazuelas. I think this dates to the seventh century or so. And there's a bit of a pyramid at the back. I was there a few weeks ago, which is why I have a photograph. But one of the things that uh, ecologically characterizes this broader zone is, is what's called milpa, which is this combination of maize beans and squash and chili peppers, of which, are, which are traditionally grown together. Uh, but of course, that, that, those traditions of agriculture stretch from the tropical forest, the Maya zone, all the way up to uh, places like uh, New Mexico and the American Southwest, and right, right across a very wide range of ecology. So it defines a cultural ecologization, which is not defined by biology. Now what's interesting is the components of that don't originate in one place. So it's very often tempting to think about centers of origin and diffusion, but there is no center of origin here. So maize, squash, and there's different species of squash from different areas. Beans, and again there's different species of beans, I've just picked out one of each here, seem to originate in different places and at different times in different cultures. But they eventually come together and unify over quite a large area. And that's very important in terms of their larger development. So this the, the Sierra Madre chain of hills is very important for the diffusion of these, things, of these crops to the north. It's also very important for cross-pollination between maize and its wild relatives. We now know that the wild centers of the Sierra Madre provide all sorts of adaptations to temperate conditions and mountain conditions, which are essential when maize gets into uh, further north. Now, of course, it's usually thought of that uh, you know things come from the south and spread to the north. But if you actually say, when does this package of crops come together, the earliest evidence is up here in New Mexico, and it's in competition with stuff from the Tuatha Valley. So not in the center of civilization at all. So there's just as much a case to say that these things originate, that this package came together up here, and then spread south as it started in the south. 
But of course, broadly speaking, we see these later interlinks with things like ball points. What am I doing on top? Another couple of minutes. Okay. I'm probably over time. So I'm going to just, so that, that's my sort of thought on ecologizations, not fully work, just some sort of thoughts on, on a way forward. Um, civilization, which we tend to privilege, and, and we, you know, people love to produce, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, I think I helped make this diagram, uh, but uh, you know, produce these global unilinear trajectories of human population and technological advance and so forth. It's a very nice way to summarize things, but of course it misses out a lot of the diversity of what's actually going on. Um, but our classical civilizations maybe have something to answer for. So when you look at, uh, there's a, uh, some of you saw William Ruddyman when he spoke in the department in October, there's, a, uh, there's a, a hypothesis with a fair amount of support for it that global greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide and methane, start to increase sometime in the mid-Holocene. So here's the methane curve for the last 5,000 years compared to interglacial averages over the last uh, seven or eight interglacials, and here's the carbon dioxide. Curve. So it's starting to diverge from what typically happens sorry, after the, over the last six interglacials. Um, and so the, what's causing this? Well, it's land use. It's things like agriculture and deforestation, rice paddies, farting cattle, metallurgy, and so, and so forth. And so one can look at that and say, okay, well, we have the spread of agriculturalists. So this was a, a, a quick and dirty attempt for me uh, of trying to quantify the land area under Neolithic economies in the old world, so the amount of land, land area under agriculture and pastoralism over time for all of Africa and Eurasia. And of course, it increases uh, gradually, so you can see that as, as, a, as a major contributing factor to this. But we also need to think about how those urban revolutions um, provide a multiplier effect. So our classic sort of civilizations bring with it increased production of pottery, things like shipping containers, copper working, iron working, baked bricks. This particular timeline is uh, taking an example from India, uh, but all of these things require more fuel demands, more deforestation, and of course you have larger populations on which you have to add these multiple effects. So these then, in the end, are affecting the global environment in which we, which we have inherited. And so one of the, the things that we need to, I think, start to do as archaeologists is to think in terms of how uh, the impact of civilization and past land use ecologization over the long term has had a, uh, a lasting and potentially a global effect, and we need to do a better job of trying to document and quantify some of those effects. Okay, thank you, Dory. Um, I'm just going to restrict some remarks uh, uh, just uh, for the last uh, few minutes, and I'll try and I will keep to uh, you know sort of ten minutes. And I really wanted to address what I see as the you know elephant in the room, which uh, perhaps we uh, need to come back to, and that is the uh, impact of uh, the classic archaeological concept of civilization outside archaeology. Uh, I think we've seen some very good uh, di 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 uh, 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 discussions uh, in, in three speakers so far around the way in which uh, these, th the, these patterns are being drawn apart and uh, particularly the archaeological focus on the long term and large area or kind of regimes and particularly uh, trying to dis disentangle uh, these uh, patterns from uh, what was the classic via golden child definition of uh, civilization? And that, I remind you, was uh, you know the seven trades: urbanism, literacy, early state formation, commerce and trade, economic specialization and intensification of agriculture, monumental architecture. Now, I mean that may well be seen in in a, in, in a certain kind of shibboleth way, you know, sort of within archaeology. Uh, what one has to perhaps be very aware of is how uh, significant and uh, really striking it is how the, 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 the impact that child has outside of archaeology, particularly in uh, study students of long-term history, global history, and amongst anthropologists in my own experience, and in particular perhaps my, my, my most well-known, Jack Goody. Uh, where in his most recent books, The Theft of History and the Eurasian Miracle, and uh, for that matter, Metal's Culture and Capitalism, uh, he refers constantly to Child 1947. It's, it's like an icon, it's, it's, it's an icon. 
is a, is, a, is an absolute benchmark to which all things refer. When he does so, and, uh, and, and I, frankly I also add to that a uh, number of other more sociologically inclined historians uh, working within world systems and dependency theory, uh, Andre Gunter Frank, you know, 5,000 you know, 5, years of, you know, sort of civilization as capitalism, you know, capitalism and civilization uh, are joined together. Early capitalism was founded with the, uh, you know, with the rise of the Bronze Age. So the, the rupture of the rise of the Bronze Age is uh, an emphatically emphasized feature in many of these accounts of uh, ancient and modern capitalism. Uh, Jonathan Friedman and Kaiser Eckholm have uh, also made, reiterated this theme. In other words, it's out there. Uh, there's, large, there's a large literature out there. It's all being taught in various guises and forms all over the place. And it's rooted in, uh, effectively, an archaeological statement uh, made over 60 or 70 years ago, uh, which is seen as the, the, you know, the accreditation of why one should uh, recognize this. Also, clearly, there is a significant archaeological uh, focus on the Bronze Age, or the rise <coughs> of the Bronze Age, uh, as a significant rupture. And the idea of Neolithic to Bronze Age as rupture uh, is also, uh, you know, not just simply uh, seen out there, but also uh, is, uh, is, is a feature of certain assumptions within uh, 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 an archaeology. And I'm particularly thinking of uh, the work done by the Bronze Age group in the University of Gothenburg around Christian Christiansen, uh, you know, as, a, as an example. Um, I also, you know, sort of want to raise the uh, the, the the issue that uh, the notion of rupture uh, of Neolithic to Bronze Age was contested by anthropologists, particularly the most well-known anthropologist of the 20th century, Claude Lévi-Strauss. You know, sort of uh, again over 60 or 70 years ago, more or less just after uh, uh, Via Gordon Child, uh, particularly in his uh, uh, travelogue *Tris Tropique*. In which he basically argued that the Neolithic was still with us, that where he travelled in Amazonia, where he travelled or saw, um, you know, a Rousseauesque view of anthropology and ethnography still possible in the world, and he was lamenting, you know, the decline of the Neolithic in his own time. But he talks about being a Neolithic man. And it's quite clear that he would like to be living in a Neolithic modernity. And he was arguing that there's a Neolithic modernity and a Bronze Age modernity side by side, parallel with each other, in the world now. And one had choices as to which of these uh, directions one should go in. He linked, obviously, the idea of the, the Bronze Age or his notion of civilization, and it's uh, very much linked to his own uh, contest, not only with Jean-Paul Sartre at the time, but in particular with Levi Brun. And uh, Levi Brule's distinction between the idea of a primitive soul and a modern or civilized soul, which actually Levi Brule as a, you know, the, the backward versus the forward, the, you know, the primitive in some kind of evolutionary sense. And Levi Brule actually rejected that uh, in his later writing, right at the end of his life, and said, and it was Levi Brule who actually said, the primitive soul is in the modern soul. We are all, we are fused together. Our, our notions of spirituality, our notions of mysticism, you know, things which are, you know, sort of always seen in great tension, you know, if you think like Stonehenge and whatever, you know, are actually fused together in our own single bodies, in our own single souls. And he, uh, and he says, what happened to it? Why, when, when did this idea of them becoming so separate? And he linked it very much to violence. So I'll give you a quote from Tris Tropique, and this is from Levi-Strauss. My hypothesis, if correct, would oblige us to recognize the fact that the primary function of writing as a means of communication is to facilitate the enslavement of other human beings. The use of writing for disinterested ends is a secondary result of its invention and may even be no more than a way of reinforcing, justifying, or dissimulating its primary function. Now, 
I mean, what Levi-Strauss was also wanting to emphasize in his kind of classic work, The Savage Mind, was what he called the logic of the concrete, or the science of the concrete. So he again came back to this idea of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, or civilizational, as two modes of mentality, or of thought, or of classification. One that was intuitive and imaginary, and the other that was calculative reason, based on abstraction. And his concern was when and how did this uh, distinction between the, the imaginary, the intuitive, and the abstract and the calculative uh, become separate from each other. In his own way, he was very Rousseau-esque, and he was seeing this in a post-Enlightenment, uh, post-Renaissance way. Um, but he's also in many ways taken up by, by particularly Jack Goody, and saying, this actually goes back to the beginnings of this rupture between Bronze Age and, I, and, and, and Neolithic. It starts with, you know, the first, with urbanism, it starts with literacy. That's when you have abstraction, that's when you have calculative reason. And of course, you now have, uh, you know, sort of people like Ramstorff on wait, the, wait, the first waiting systems, end of the fourth millennium. Uh, the idea of, you know, sort of branding and being able to brand in order to ensure the integrity of the contents and uh, between uh, merchants who did not necessarily know each other. Uh, the idea that uh, you would be able to uh, ensure the authenticity of the goods uh, by being able to calculate uh, their size, their weight or whatever. I think uh, uh, what Andy was uh, describing in terms of those trends or tendencies you know, sort of, uh, it's, 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 it's really fantastic stuff. I mean, this is what archaeology provides. It does show, actually, that there is some kind of this di di dichotomy of, if you, maybe Lev Strauss was absolutely bang on. We do have some kind of rupture, but it's not a rupture of before and after, it's side by side. Oh, yeah. I didn't Why mean to say anything oh, bad. Um, <laughs> so, but there's also an added point to this. When one looks at in terms of this dichotomy, then one's drawn to inevitably to these uh, civilizational centers. One just uses the word civilization in this sort of, well, we all know what that means, but we also know that it means, you know, sort of China or, you know, Mesopotamia or Egypt or whatnot. What it doesn't tell us is the rest, what the rest of the world is. In the theft of history, uh, Goody is absolutely explicit. <coughs> Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, is stuck in the near east. <coughs> he talks about hoe cultivation versus plough agriculture. It's about patterns of inheritance. It's about marriage alliance patterns. It's about that you have uh, 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 pro-Omaha kinship systems in, uh, you know, sort of in sub-Saharan Africa, as against, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, systems which basically are, 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 are patrilineal and, uh, and, 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 pap and patrilateral. That therefore, those who bring property and people <coughs> together and close them as classically in the Middle East. He's constantly saying Africa is stuck in the Neolithic in a way which means that it now uh, emerges only in recent history and one thinks of Sarkozy going to Dakar and saying to presidents of uh, African states, well you're just, Africa is just emerging into history, we are, France is just there waiting for you, you know, we'll have the technological means and the science there just waiting for you. I mean, it was, you know, impossible to imagine that Trevor, Hugh Trevor Roper could still be there in, you know, in 2009. But what Goody wanted to emphasize, of course, was the Eurasian miracle. And the idea that this civilizational spread finally uh, could be traced to encompass you know, something called Eurasia. He was arguing against Eurocentrism and the idea of Europe as a single linear form, you know, sort of going from the, you know, from uh, uh, that, that kind of classic idea of Western civilization. So it's Eurasia that becomes the focus of alternating centers of wealth and accumulation and control over population. It's that that becomes the focus of where civilization must be in some vast, overarching, interacting way. But Africa gets left out. The South gets left out. 
uh, from Oceania to Melanesia, you know, Oceania, Melanesia, through South, you know, through Ireland, the, the you know, sort of Ireland Southeast Asian Neolithic, through to Southern India, uh, Sri Lanka, across the Indian Ocean to Sub-Saharan Africa, as Dorian has uh, shown in, on, on, with, uh, with his work with, with Boivin on the Indian Ocean. You have these uh, systematic flows and interactions over thousands of years, they, uh, which all appear to avoid this sort of civilizational Eurasian complex, and in particular the idea of uh, you know sort of long distance commercial civilizational trade. It's not trade. There are hundreds of thousands of beads uh, in Great Zimbabwe and Mapungubwe uh, in, 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 in South Africa and Zimbabwe, which are from, in some way or other, derived from South India. Thornton and Viv van Binsbergen has talked about how Sangoma cults, healing, curing cults in South Africa, actually have strong borrowings or analogies. They are very similar to some of the cults that you find and temple cults that you find in South India. They're linked up with each other. So there's another big spread over this whole area. It's Neolithic and it's civilizational in any of the scale terms that we uh, have heard about, but it's got nothing to do with any of the Gordon Child definitions of urbanism, uh, of, of civilization, of, of civilization. So there's something else which, but it's a very moral, ethical world we live in. Why and, and, and on what basis can we simply assert that what Goody and, uh, frankly, a lot of social historians, global historians, world historians, and anthropologists out there use archaeological uh, work for, and particularly the child uh, hypothesis for, in this unchallenged way within archaeology, how can we justify that when it has these strong ethical and moral, moral implications and consequences for how we see the world? So. I just leave you, in a sense, with a challenge. You should be significantly crit critiquing and deconstructing child and the concept of civilization that he's left with us. And I would hope that that might be one of the consequences of this evening. Thank you. Okay, we uh, now pass to Beverly, Bev Butler, who will act as our discussant. I don't envy no. you at all. <laughs> I was if you could just, no, no, yeah. not quite attractive because no, you know. No, no. But if you could open us, us up and then we just sort of quickly. I, will. Uh, I just discussion. wanted actually to thank my colleagues for engaging in this kind of deconstruction of civilization. Um, and opening up to much more possibilities. Um, there is a kind of vested interest that I have because um, uh, Andre Malraux, after the Second World War, said all that um, used to be described as civilization has now become heritage. And it was a very interesting you know, idea of what, you know, kind of the alleged decline of empire, what was going to happen now we had heritage. Then you get the, not only as you call it, the Golden Child benchmark time as well, you get the rise of UNESCO, and UNESCO very much bought into the idea, the outstanding universal value, that um, heritage was about monumentalism, and it has a civilizational trope that we map. And since then, it's been trying to, in a sense, cure itself from all of the assumptions that it's took on from them by doing things like intangible heritage and, you know, kind of having ideas of living heritage. So I was interested in, in how, you know, kind of these new perspectives would help, in a sense, heritage, public archaeology, think about this as past and the present, as well as, as you know, kind of historical debates and endeavours. Um, and also with um, Andre Malraux, it was uh, it's a real paradox, because he was the one who um, wrote Museum Without Walls and was into the idea of the mobile. So I think it's quite interesting that one of the things that um, from David onwards was brought in was the idea of counterexamples of civilization being about things like the margins, older traditions that had gone on you know, prior to the state. Um, also the idea of not reducing things to the state, civilization to the state, and, and UNESCO currently is about the nation state being the biggest player in all of this kind of definition of what heritage is. 
um, um, Andy's um, comments on things like the idea of ambivalence and hybridising, and you know having that kind of um, uh, dynamic between canonisation and um, experimentalism is a really interesting way um, forward as well, especially in the idea of values. Um, you know, because the idea of heritage values, like you know any idea of civilization values are, are, are really kind of, there's a lot at stake in defining these things or redefining these as well. So the diaspora, all of those kinds of things were very um, interesting and very useful. When Dorian was talking about his ecologization as well, I mean that was just quite interesting in the terms of this strange splitting we get in terms of things like natural and cultural heritage. Um, so actually, you know, challenging all of those things through the past and the idea of, you know, issuing them now and trying to define um, cultural heritage by those um, terminologies now. Um, also, uh, the idea of the elephant in the room being the idea of how, it, how civilization functions outside archaeology. Well, I would be proud, in a sense, to take on you know, the, the kind of critical angles that people have discussed today and take that to heritage. Um, to think about these terms because I do think it has a lot of um, salience for contemporary constituencies and I'm thinking about people who I work with in Jordan in refugee camps, the people in Pal you know, Palestinians in the refugee camps, Syrians, where you get this kind of so-called no non-place but actually heritage um, and what you might call civilizational ways of making and remaking self and world in extremis is so important. And these are, you know, kind of vibrant places, you know, to, to understand these kind of what they would call cultural traditions. So thank you very much. I've learned a lot from archaeology. Um